Today, I would just like to discuss some knots in, or what I would like to call some curves in the first law of thermodynamics. Now, we know that the first law of thermodynamics is sometimes referred to as the law of conservation of energy, because what it says is that the total energy in an isolated system is constant. So, the energy within an isolated system can, can be transformed, right? can be transformed. That is, it can change from one form to another, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Now, generally, we say that the, uh, the internal energy change of a system is equal to Q plus W. Now, this is coming from the fact that the internal energy of a system is equal to the kinetic the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, all right? Now, of course, the potential energy aspect would more connect with the work component, whereas the kinetic energy aspect would connect with the heat change. Because as we know, heat, the heat of a system which is manifested as um, in the, uh, by the temperature uh, is really a measure of the uh, average kinetic energy of the particles in a body. Now, we know already that kinetic energy, Ek, all right, as represented here, is equal to something like half mv squared. And so, when you measure the temperature of a body, you're measuring the average kinetic energy. You're basically measuring the average kinetic energy of the particles in that body. However, the kinetic energy of the particles is directly proportional to um, the square of the velocity of the particles uh, within that body. Now, so, so that's that's basically a start to the first law of thermodynamics. Now, now, there are other things that you can take from the first law of thermodynamics. Now, let's see how we can uh, get some of this information out of the principles that are there in the first law of thermodynamics. Now, first of all, as we said, delta U is equal to Q plus W. Now, W, how is it that a chemical system can do work? So W is work, all right? Q is the heat change, okay? Now, we know what Q comes down to. Q is equal to C delta T, okay? But work, how can we get work out of, for example, a chemical system? Now, we know that mechanical work, W, is equal to force times distance, right? Force times distance. Now, let's say a reaction occurs in a vessel, okay? Let's say we have a movable piston here, movable piston, okay? And... A reaction takes place in this vessel, a gas is produced, okay? A gas is produced, and because a gas is produced, you find that the cover of the system moves upward, okay? An example of such a reaction could be, let's say you have something like uh, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate could break down to give you something like calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. This is a gas. Let's say this is a solid. This is a solid. This is an example of such a reaction. Now, what you realize is that during such a reaction, a gas is produced, carbon dioxide. Originally, you started out with a solid, calcium carbonate. When the reaction, when the reaction occurs, you get calcium oxide, which is a solid, and a gas is formed. That gas pushes the piston or the cover upwards. Now, acting or pushing, pushing down on the cover is what you call the external pressure, P external, which is the weight of the molecules in the atmosphere pushing down on the cover. That weight or that force caused by the weight of the molecules in the atmosphere, we tend to call that atmospheric pressure. Or in this diagram, we represent that as P external. Okay, 
So it is also over here. Okay? It's always there. Now, we said earlier that work, mechanical work, is equal to force times distance. All right? Now, this piston traveled some distance upwards. Okay? Started here. You could call that H initial, and it ended up here. H final. All right? H initial to H final. So there was a change. There was a change in the height of the cover. Delta H, which is change in height of the cover, is H final minus H initial, which is equal to the distance traveled by the cover D. Okay? All right. Force. All right. Force could be represented by the pressure because pressure is equal to force per unit area. That is force over area. And so we could rearrange this expression to make force a subject. So we have pressure times area is equal to force. So what we could do is to substitute this into the expression for work. And so we could write now work is equal to pressure times area times distance. Okay? Now let's look back at the at the cylinder. The volume of the cylinder, the volume of the cylinder or the volume of any three-dimensional object is equal to uh cross-sectional area, okay, times the length of the object, all right, cross-sectional area times the length of the object. Let's say the height of the object, h, cross-sectional area times the height of the object. However, if you are looking at a change in the volume of this three-dimensional object, then you must also have a change in either the cross-sectional area or the height of the object. Indeed, for us, the cross-sectional area was fixed, but there was a change in the height. Remember, delta H, delta H is the same thing as D. So we could write change in volume is equal to cross-sectional area times D. Okay? Now we could rearrange this expression. All right? We could rearrange this expression such that D is the subject. Okay? So it's delta V divided by A is equal to D. Now what we could do is to wherever we have D in the work expression over here, we could substitute delta V over A. So look at this. Look at this. Work is equal to P times A times delta V over A. All right, delta V over A, okay? So A here can cancel with A there. So work then is equal to P times delta V. Now, if work is done by the system, then we could put a minus sign. And so we generally say that, we generally make the assumption that work is done by the system and so we always present this expression with the minus sign. So we say that work is equal to minus P delta V. Work done by a system is equal to minus P delta V. Okay? So that's how you can calculate the work done by the system. Now look at this expression. This expression is very interesting. This expression is very interesting. Why? Because, matter of fact, let me just provide some more space, all right, now that we have seen clearly how this expression uh, was derived. Let's just clean up a little bit so that we could discuss further without getting confused with all the writings that we have here. Okay, let's just clean up a little bit. Okay, take some time to clean up and some energy also. Okay. Okay, all right. Let's put this expression back at the top so we can have some space at the bottom to 
to uh, to work. Okay. All right. Let's put it here. We say that work is equal to minus p delta v, and we saw how that expression was derived. Now, don't forget. Don't forget that according to the ideal gas, according to the ideal gas um, laws, PV is equal to nRT. Okay, don't forget that. So, if there's a change in the volume, for example, P delta V, then there must be a change in something over here. All right, and that is changing something on the right hand side. So it could be delta N R T. Okay, and so what we find is that work done by a system could be equal to minus P delta V, but it is also equal to delta N R T. Okay, don't forget that. And so what you find now for delta U, delta U, which is internal energy change, we could write. Um, Q minus P delta V or or we could write Q minus delta N R T. Okay? Let us not forget that. That is very important. Now, we have to say a few more things. There are a few more knots. There are a few more curves and turns um, surrounding the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, let me just provide some more space here. Okay, let's see. All right, so we started out with delta U is equal to Q plus W. But then we realized that delta U, right, is equal to Q minus P delta V. Now, let's say, let's say you are conducting a reaction in a vessel, right? You're conducting a reaction in a vessel with um, a vessel which is made up of um, thick steel walls, right? So the walls of the vessel, these walls are very thick, all right? made of steel, and so the volume of the container cannot change. That is, delta V is equal to zero. Delta V is equal to zero. Now, if delta V is equal to zero, this means that delta U is equal to Q minus P times zero. So this part, all of this part, will become zero. So what you have is that delta U is equal to Q. Now remember that Q is equal to C, and I'm going to put CV because it's the subscript V means constant volume, right? Because we're working in a vessel where the volume cannot change. So delta U is equal to CV delta T, okay? So we can just write this. Delta U is equal to CV delta T under constant um, uh, volume conditions, okay? So what this is telling us is that the internal energy of a system, the internal energy change of a system is equal to the heat change at constant volume. Now, where is this information useful? Where in the lab or in the industry or in nature is this information useful. Let's say somebody comes up to you and they give you a piece of bread. All right, this is the piece of bread. And they said that, oh, this piece of bread weighs two grams. All right, they want you to determine the internal energy um, change of this piece of bread. Now, what you could do is to burn this piece of bread inside a bomb calorimeter. The bomb is a thick steel vessel, right? You'll have some electrical wires in there. You have what you call a cup, right? And then you have your piece of bread right here. This thick steel vessel, all right, will be immersed in water. Okay, 
cover, totally covered in water. Of course, the thick steel vessel, which is what we call the bomb, will be filled up with oxygen. Okay? Of course, you have to have a mechanical stirrer to steer the vessel. Okay? And this here is water. Right? Of a known mass, a known mass of water. Now, when the bread is burned, because these electrical wires will create a spark, in the presence of high concentration of oxygen, we'll have an explosion. And the bread will release all of its internal energy. But seeing that the walls of the bomb cannot be pushed back, that is, the volume is constant, all the internal energy change will be released or will be manifested in the form of heat. And so you could stick a thermometer, you could stick a thermometer into this vessel and take the temperature. So you can get the temperature change. And if you know the heat capacity of the water jacket and of the bomb CV, then what you could do, seeing that you would have measured the temperature change, you could easily make use of this expression in calculating the internal energy change of the piece of bread. Easily. Right? This is called bomb calorimetry. Okay? Okay. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something else. Okay, let's see if we can clear things up. See if we can create some space so we can have um, further discussions. Okay. Hmm, this one refused to, to move. Okay. Now, so we mentioned internal energy, the whole idea of internal energy, and we said that um, we said that internal energy change delta U is equal to CV delta T, all right, which allows us now um, to rearrange this expression a little bit to say that delta U divided by delta T is equal to the constant volume heat capacity. Just to point that out. Just to point that uh, information out. However, what we must know is that most chemical reactions in nature do not occur under constant volume conditions, but they occur rather under um, constant pressure conditions, which is under atmospheric pressure. And so the use of internal energy to study a chemical reaction might not be the most convenient um, tool. So there's another tool though, there's another tool called enthalpy or enthalpy change. Enthalpy represented by H is equal to the sum of the internal energy and the product of pressure and volume. Okay, however, what you, um, the use of um, absolute values for thermodynamic parameters is difficult and so what we rather to use is relative values so instead of using h instead of talking about enthalpy we like to talk about enthalpy change enthalpy change is a relative value but enthalpy is a absolute value which is difficult to obtain and sometimes end up meaningless so we need to differentiate this expression here and this is how we do it delta h right is equal to delta U plus P delta V plus V delta P plus delta P delta V. Okay? Now, if the pressure is constant, if the pressure is constant, right? If pressure is constant, then what we have is that delta H is equal to delta U Okay, plus P delta V. Okay, so the enthalpy change then is equal to the internal energy change plus the product of pressure and the volume change. However, you should know that the volume could be constant and the pressure is changing and in that case, you would use this one. Okay, all right. Now we can do something else. There's something interesting about this equation. 
Earlier, remember we defined enthalpy as enthalpy is the sum of the internal energy of a system plus the product of pressure and volume. Now let's do something interesting with this equation, this one here. Let's rearrange it a little bit. Delta H, okay, uh, minus P delta V, of course, that is equal to delta U, okay? Very interesting. So delta H, so delta U is equal to delta H minus P delta V. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Now, another thing we should note, another thing we should note about uh, uh, enthalpy, enthalpy is sometimes loosely defined, enthalpy change I should say, is sometimes loosely defined as the heat transferred at constant pressure. And we want to prove that this is so, that enthalpy is sometimes defined as the uh, heat transferred at constant pressure. Let us prove that. Let us prove that. No matter of fact, I will probably prove that before I go any further with this one here. Okay, let us back up a little bit. Let's remove this. We are going to prove, we are going to prove that that expression which I have over here to the right in the circle, this one here, we are going to prove that this is so. All right, let's see if I can prove that. All right, and the expression says that enthalpy change is equal to the heat change at constant pressure. Okay, let's see if I can prove that. All right. Delta H is equal to delta U, right? That's delta U right there. All right, but remember what delta U is equal to. Delta U, I think, is equal to Q, all right, plus... Well, not plus, actually, not plus. Let us not, um, well, yeah, we could go with plus for now and then fix it in the next line, W, plus P delta V, right? So I just basically put this back right there, okay? And this is, all of this is delta U, right? All of this is delta U. All right, I'll fix this in the next line now by saying delta H is equal to Q, but remember, W is equal to what? P delta V, right? Plus, I'm going to put this back. P delta V. Okay? This one here, I'm sure you'll agree, will cancel with that one. So what you find is that delta H is equal to Q. All right, and we say that this is true under constant pressure conditions, okay? Remember what Q is equal to. Q is the heat change, all right? So delta H is equal to Q, constant pressure, which is equal to Cp delta T. Cp is the constant pressure, heat capacity. So what this tells me then is that I could write that delta H is equal to Cp delta T which I can rearrange this expression here. I could rearrange this expression and get delta H, right, divided by delta T is equal to Cp, okay? Now, that is something, that is something interesting. That is something interesting, right? Now, why is that, why is that interesting? I'm going to show you now that you can convert between constant pressure and constant volume heat capacity. You can convert between constant pressure and constant volume heat capacities. Let's see how that is done. Let's see if I can, if I can um, show you that. All right, remember now, let's just remind ourselves that delta H is equal to delta U, right? Plus, I think, P delta V. Now this, remember, this one here is the same thing as delta NRT. Delta H then could be written as delta U plus delta NRT. Now, if we are working with a 
if we are working with a one molar system, so let's say if system is one molar, all right, okay, uh, or, or let's say, let's say, let's, let, let's say if the system, all right, let me just fix this here, write it an easier way. Let's just say, say it in a much simpler way. Let's say if delta n is equal to one and t is changing, t is changing. Let's ignore that. Then this is what we have. Delta h is equal to delta u right plus r delta t okay now delta h we know what delta h is equal to delta h is equal to q at constant pressure right and delta u is equal to q at constant volume plus r delta t right we showed that earlier that delta u is the same thing as heat change at constant volume Whereas delta H is heat change at constant pressure. Heat change is equal to C. Well, in this case, it's constant pressure heat capacity times delta T, which is equal to C V delta T plus R delta T. All we have to do now is divide through by delta T. Delta T. delta t all right so what we have is that cp is equal to cv plus r see here we go so we can convert cp to cv and vice versa okay and those are some of the those are some of the basic knots in the first law of thermodynamics some of the simplest manipulations that you can do um, where the first law of thermodynamics is concerned. Now, I have a few videos already here where we are trying some questions where we are applying the uh, first law of thermodynamics to actual chemical systems. So this video um, was just to focus on some of the basic um, knots um, concerning our, you know, associated with the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, guys, look out for the next video where I will look at some of the knots concerning the second law of thermodynamics. Take care. Bye-bye.